Thanks, Julia. And thank you uh, for this opportunity to share for the first time my work uh, with a larger audience until now, just my supervisor and my committee and lab mates have heard about the project. So I'm certain for their sakes, they are pleased I'm now talking to others about it. My name is Megan and I too am a student um, at the University of Waterloo in public health and health systems. And I am uh, focusing on co-working spaces. And so my PhD thesis topic was partially developed as a result of my own experiences with working from home. While I had the privilege of working from anywhere for my studies, I chose to go into my assigned desk at the university to work. With my own struggles with mental illness and difficulty saying enough work for today, I found I needed the physical separation from my home and the social connection my peers offered. I similarly became very skeptical of the circulating discourses of work from home, work from anywhere, based on my own experiences and the exponential growth and pervasiveness of these co-working spaces I was hearing about. If working from home was so great, why were people choosing to work in these co-working spaces with complete strangers and paying to do so? Meanwhile, through my supervisor's research, focus on the transformations of work and the impact on workers with respect to occupational health and safety risks, I became familiar with the rise in non-standard work and the growing percentage of the Canadian labor force falling outside the scope of the standard employment relationship and the rights and protections it affords. Here I use Judy Fudge's definition of the SER characterized by a continuous full-time relationship in which a worker has one employer and normally works on the employer's premises under the employer's supervision. And so non-standard forms of work include versions of self-employment, part-time, casual, or project-based work, as well as those distributed or remote workers of large organizations. While non-standard work is not inherently precarious, it has the potential to be uncertain, unpredictable, and risky with low remuneration and minimal social protection. Neither non-standard work nor precarious work are new per se, but what has changed is the pervasiveness of these employment phenomena. And so I began to think co-working spaces offered an intriguing case to explore some of the complexities of the transformation of paid work in the 21st century. Shared co-working spaces have proliferated worldwide, offering flexible solutions for both organizations small startups and lone workers alike. As centralized sites containing various forms of non-standard workers, they provided access to a growing population of unbound or invisible workers who had the flexibility to work from anywhere, but chose to pay for space to work. For those not familiar with co-working, for a membership fee, tenants or co-workers have access to shared workspaces. Co-working spaces differ with regards to their business models, amenities, size, workstations, and even the types of workers they cater to. For instance, women identifying only, niche industries, etc. Most of the research on co-working spaces to date has framed the phenomenon as a solution to the social isolation and displacement felt by independent knowledge workers or those that do not have an employer provided workspace and situates co-working as a response to increasing flexibility and precarity. In today's sharing economy, scholars have argued that the risks and costs traditionally carried by the organizations have been downloaded to the workers. The concept of co-working has certainly evolved and commodified versions of co-working are a far cry from how co-working was initially envisioned a worker-driven grassroots solution to share workspace and offer social and community support for fellow independent freelancers. 
Despite the emergent body of literature from diverse disciplines examining the social support offered and problematizing the neoliberal imperatives that underpin a growing number of these co-working spaces, research is warranted to explore the forms and extent of social interactions that occur, as well as the emergent and dynamic communities that develop within these spaces, including how they are constituted and sustained under various management conditions. Recognizing that diverse groups of people with different values and ideological beliefs are coming together to work in a communal space, the explorations of these interactions, issues of power and conflict and potential for conflict is necessary. Further, co-working as a new form of work arrangement or workspace has received scant research attention with regards to occupational health and safety issues. Similar to forms of non-standard work, researchers have highlighted emerging workspaces as often unregulated and invisible in relation to occupational health and safety legislation. The physical work conditions, including ergonomic considerations, the psychosocial environments, and the organizational structures of co-working spaces have also received minimal research to date with calls for further investigation. And so, for my research, understanding the daily work patterns, physical and psychosocial conditions, as well as the social interactions and communities that emerge in co-working spaces was necessary. And my research project was to examine the everyday work practices and experiences of workers in these spaces, better understand the physical and psychosocial working conditions and to investigate the health of workers in this non-standard workspace arrangement. And just as I was about to embark on my qualitative data collection, COVID-19 hit. And fortunately, due to the qualitative nature of my study and that a great deal of my research can be conducted virtually, I have been able to continue with my research from my makeshift desk in my makeshift office in my living room. Of course, the world of work has undergone significant changes. And so the landscape in which co-working exists is in flux. In the remainder of my presentation, I will highlight a few of these changes and what this has meant for my research. So the Canadian Labor Force Survey, which is used to estimate the current conditions of the labor market, introduced new questions to capture the impacts of COVID-19 on the labor market. New questions included working from home, and in the April Labor Force Survey report, 5 million employed Canadians worked from their home, with 3.3 million of these workers who usually worked at a location other than their home. According to the report, this change in work location was assumed to be in response to the COVID-19 economic shutdown. Data from the October Labor Force Survey highlight that as of mid-October, 2.4 million workers still remained working from home that do not normally do so. While non-essential organizations of all sizes have reopened over the sum summer and fall months, there has been an accelerated acceptance of flexible work arrangements and remote work for workers that don't need to be in close physical contact with others to perform their work roles. As Joe Costaldo reported for the Globe and Mail in September, just as much of the business world was thrust into a massive remote work experiment roughly six years ago, another experiment is underway as companies figure out how to blend remote work with time in the office. That hybrid model in which employees have flexibility about where and how they work is likely to become much more common, forcing companies to reassess their long-term office needs. So, for instance, Facebook and Shopify are two large employers that have made decisions to minimize their physical workspace footprint, permanently closing some of their offices. Similarly, Kathleen Hogan, Chief People Officer at Microsoft, announced on the official Microsoft blog that they were embracing a flexible workplace. What do we know from the research? 
What makes studying flexible and remote work arrangements challenging to study is its diversity, limitations in how it is conceptualized and measured, as well as its invisibility. Beyond the basic condition that remote work or telework occurs off the employer's supervised premises, remote work is dynamic with respect to its organization. Is it total, partial, occasional? The employment relationship is the worker employed by an organization or an independent contractor? The location of where that remote work occurs, is it at home, a third space, or intermediate travel spaces? And the actual communication and information technology that's used, computer, telephone, laptop, mobile phone, tablet, computer, or a smartphone. While telework is associated with no positive individual and organizational outcomes, it's also associated with negative outcomes at both the individual and organizational level. The actual time spent teleworking and whether it is employer or worker driven appears to influence whether the outcome is beneficial or detrimental as well. And yet the under specification of teleworking attributes in the research to date creates uncertainty for employers and policymakers looking to implement beneficial aspects of telework while avoiding the negative effects. Despite the increase in teleworkers, there's limited research also on the management of distributed workers to ensure occupational health and safety and occupational health and safety leadership of this group of workers is similarly an understudied topic. Regarding worker well-being, while companies with remote working policies have been praised for encouraging work-life balance, remote work has also been noted in the research to contribute to stress due to the role conflict. In fact, in the literature, it has been well documented that work-life interference disproportionately affects women with females experiencing greater tension and blurring of work and family domain. Despite optimistic work-life work balance rhetoric, flexible working practices can be employee-friendly or employer-friendly, and discourses are often at odds with these policies and practice. Of course, all of this research on remote working practices has been conducted outside pandemic conditions when choice and child care support were more readily available. So, what does this mean for co-working spaces? Owing to the flexibility inherently built into the co-working model, the co-working phenomenon may not only assist those work, workers untethered from an employer, but those that have been given the freedom of working remotely during the foreseen future as we wait out the pandemic and our employers' long-term responses. Whether to assist with the pangs of loneliness and social isolation, or to offer a reprieve from the noisy home filled with family members and distractions, the co-working community members and operators of my research see co-working as a solution. Ultimately trying to determine whether the co-working phenomenon may be a viable practice to sustain an amalgam of workers, work practices, health and well-being is playing out in real time in unprecedented circumstances to be continued.